Hey, Chris Potts here. This is part two in our series of screencasts on quantifier properties. In part one, we made some connections with the Keenan reading, the semantics of determiners, and we reviewed what I assume and hope are some pretty uncontroversial determiner meanings. For this screencast, we're going to focus on two pragmatic aspects of determiners, lexical uncertainty and context dependence. These two things are related and have some overlap and interactions, but I still think we can tease them apart. So let's begin with lexical uncertainty in section four, and I'm gonna center this discussion around a single example in the hopes that that will help you spot lexical uncertainty elsewhere, because I think it's actually pretty pervasive in natural languages. So consider the phrase between five and 10. We can treat it as a quantificational determiner akin to at least three and so forth. And then we can ask, what are its truth conditions? Now, my contention is that both 13a and 13b are in use in our speech community. That is, it isn't a settled matter which denotation or which semantic convention is correct or even dominant. In 13a, we have what you might call an inclusive reading because it includes 5 and 10, the two bounds. In 13b, we have an exclusive reading, a reading that excludes the bounds 5 and 10. So what are your intuitions? If I told you that there would be between five and 10 quizzes in a quarter and there were 10, would you feel that I had misrepresented things? What if I assured you that there would be between five and 10 quizzes and there were five? Or what if I promised myself to have between five and 10 quizzes and I managed to get out only five? Uh, what, what we regard as good and bad or desirable and undesirable may be shaping our intuitions here. Suppose I told you the price was between five and $10 and it was 10. Or I suppose I reassured you that the cost would be between five and $10 and it was five. Did I speak truthfully or did I lead you astray? Things might be different if we move to more precise values as well. Suppose I told you the price was between $5.27 and $10.34 and it was 527 or 1034. And things might be different yet again if we move into other less numerical settings, right? If a government form asked you whether you'd been in Canada in the period between August 1 and August 31, and you arrived in Toronto on August 31, what would you do? Would you err on the side of caution? Or maybe it would depend on what the nature of this form was. Or how about clearly continuous examples? I think we can agree that the dot is between the two lines in this first example. What about the second? Hmm. Right. My point in all this is that there may not be a fact of the matter concerning the truth conditions for these phrases. And I think people are aware of that at some level, right? Where it matters, you often see people actually tacking on the word inclusive or exclusive to clarify their intention somewhat. Now, this is by no means unique to the template between X and Y as a sort of lexical determiner. Uh, as I said above, I think lexical uncertainty is pervasive in natural languages. I gave a few more examples in this footnote, and I'm sure you can think of others. And these, uh, these things can be persistent and persistently confusing. Uh, it's noteworthy, though, I think that it affects even quantificational determiners, which seem like they offer at least the potential for real precision. All right, so let's move to section five and the related topic of context dependence. I've opened this section with this charming XKCD cartoon. It lists out some determiners in our terms, a few, a handful, several, and a couple. And it says that all of them have a meaning anywhere from two to five with a small hedge for a couple where you might feel like that needs to be exactly two, at least in some contexts. First, I should say, I'm not sure what XKCD is saying here because of the previous issue with lexical uncertainty. Did he mean the inclusive reading of anywhere from five, of two to five or the exclusive one? Now, for these items, it may not matter that much because they seem to be inherently approximate. And so it doesn't make sense to quibble about the bounds, especially the upper bound where six is surely gonna count as a few in almost any situation in which five does. But we can also ask whether these meanings are even correct. Now, to me, they seem reasonable for several and a couple, but my hunch is that they're not sensitive enough to the items we're talking about when we get to a few and a handful. I suspect that the overall size and makeup of the domain matter somewhat for them, right? So consider how you might use phrases like a few students, a few books in the library, a few stars in the sky. 
I think five may be reasonable for students, but not for books if the library is large, and almost certainly not for stars in the sky. And even if a few really is not so sensitive to the domain in the way that XKCD suggests, I'm sure that few is, where we don't include the determiner a. Uh. I think the meaning of few in 16a is the core of it, and I've given it sort of dual, many, in 16b. The hallmark of both these meanings is that we consider the cardinality of the intersection, as we do with other cardinal determiners and other things in the class, like at most three and at least three, but for few and many, the precise numerical value used for the comparison is not specified. It's what we call a pragmatic free variable. I've given it as J in 16A and K in 16B. And we should ask the question, how do these variables get their values? That is, how do we know what the speaker means with few students if we don't know what this pragmatic free variable should be valued as? I think that's a genuinely pragmatic issue Speakers wish to be understood, and listeners want to understand, and this is probably the basis for some stability that we do observe in what's intended and perceived with these context-dependent phrases. But because these variables are free variables, there is always going to be some residual uncertainty about what value they should be assumed to have. And that means we can't be precise with these phrases, and that's part of the joke, I think, in the XKCD cartoon, and it also means that there can be misunderstandings around these terms that relate to people making different assumptions about these pragmatic free variables, leading to meaningfully different assumptions about what an utterance means, even at the level of its most basic truth conditions. The class of these context-dependent determiners is large, and so whatever pragmatic process is at work here has really broad importance for communication. A final note on context dependence. Keenan also discusses what he calls approximative debts. These would be phrases like approximately 10 and almost no. These don't have pragmatic free variables in them, at least on the analyses I've given here, but they do have context dependence since what counts as close enough might really be dependent on a lot of things. So for example, I would expect approximately 10 students to be different from approximately 10,000 students and different yet again from approximately 10,154 students. And I'd expect almost no US presidents, almost no Stanford students, and almost no stars in the sky to all behave very differently from each other in terms of what counts as close enough. To wrap up, let's step back. This might seem a bit messy, and you might be wondering how we managed to communicate at all with these uncertain, vague, context-dependent phrases. And in a way, it is amazing that we do it so well, even accepting the uncertainty that we see. For now, I'll just promise that we'll develop a pragmatic theory later in the course that will interact with these uncertain semantic conventions to help us explain the stability that we do observe and also help us characterize the inevitable residual uncertainty.